How about dinosaurs and the silver screen? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> How about Jurassic World? Oh, oh yeah! <laughs> I want to see Jurassic World. That would probably be the digital screen, actually. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Just say slide when you're ready. Alright, well, welcome to the panel, everyone. My name is Kelly Rice. This is my sister, Alex. And we will be moderating today, and we have the great pleasure of introducing to you these three fine gentlemen you see, oh, four gentlemen that you see here. <laughs> yeah. So this is Mr. Greg Talley, owner and operator of the best <laughs> Also known as the Dinosaur Hotel, you should check it out. And we have Dr. Robert Walker, famed paleontologist. Along with Matthew Mossbarger, also of paleontological fame, and the curator of the Morrison Natural History Museum. Direct. And director. You may have seen Mr. Mossbarger on National Geographic, was it? Yes, that's right. Dissecting a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yep, T Rex autopsy. I didn't do it, I swear. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, weren't you in cops of the Jurassic? And to his left is Big Al the Allosaurus. <laughs> All right, science is serious. Absolutely no laughing. Okay? <laughs> We're looking at you back there. Mostly Max. Yeah, and Max. We've got an eye on it. So first off, we're going to talk about 1914's Girding the Dinosaur. And really, to study the history of dinosaurs on the silver screen, you have to understand the history of animation, since obviously since these animals are extinct, uh, making them move in a lifelike manner uh, is, is really a uh, you know, slumberland. He had a fascination with dinosaurs. He took this uh, on the road as a vaudeville act, where uh, he had Gertie dance on a projection while he uh, commanded her to do tricks and to walk around. And uh, eventually his boss, uh, William Randolph Hearst, who was the subject of Citizen Kane, uh, the newspaper magnate, did not really cotton to the idea of uh, McKay uh, doing a vaudeville act. So he squashed the act by suppressing all publicity and press coverage. So uh, McKay went to uh, the uh, guy who created uh, 20th Century Fox, uh, the precursor, act on a live action beginning and then redistributed that as just a straight up movie short. Uh, and by the way, this is before cell animation. He was the first one to create uh, animation loops, which are, are popularly used today. This is done on trace paper, rice paper. So every background you see, they drew with Gertie. This is not where you had a, uh, acetate. Uh, cell laid on top of the background, they drew this every last line, you know, frame by frame. So it's, it's a pretty uh, complex and, and astounding uh, accomplishment. So, uh, you guys want to talk about Gertie? I have a soft spot for Gertie because when I first saw this um, short when I was probably 10 years old, it depicted a very active, lovable, funny brontosaur and a long neck dinosaur. And up to that point, I had only seen animation of these dinosaurs either as Jurassic cowards running away from meat eaters hiding in swamps, or uh, even worse, uh, just as you know, meat on the ground. But this, this depiction uh, back in 1914, in my opinion, was very revolutionary. So our question, Kelly, is? Exactly what species is Gertie? Does anyone have any guesses? Patasaurus. Close. Brontosaurus. Correct. <laughs> so we have an apatosaurus, we have a brontosaurus. Do we, do we have any other guesses? What do you think? I, I am completely forgot. <laughs> it's a completely wow. forgotosaurus. Okay. Uh, That's a good guess. That's a good guess. Spinosaurus? Well, we, we what did you say? Spinosaurus? 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 That's a good guess. You guys can keep guessing. Uh, what do you think of the back? What was it? A diplodocus? Oh, very close. A dinosaurus. A patasaurus? Yes. Has anybody seen this? Are they short? 
the, the long it's on YouTube. Yeah. Go watch it. It's outside, it's outside of a copyright. You can watch the whole thing for free. Why don't you guys keep your guesses in your head, and then you can see as we go on if it gets more clear. So the first part of this cartoon, well, the, the movie is live action, where a group of scientists pull up to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and they go crowd around the skeleton. So we do know what specimen Gertie is based on. Hit that next slide. And it is a long-necked dinosaur, that specimen is human age 460, and there's some clues to that animal's identity in the book. We want to talk about the people that When the first long-necked dinosaurs were found, the first good skeleton of these gigantic dinosaur-like things was found right here in Marston, Colorado, 20 minutes away. You can see some of the bones. No one got a perfect foot. They had parts of four individuals did not have a perfect foot. And the, the brightest savans gave it three claws in the front paw on either side, total of six, three. Because many dinosaurs were known to have three claws in their front paw. This is the front paw of an allosaur. In fact, probably the animal that was stabbed in the butt and oozed the override mayonnaise. Um, <laughs> one, two, three claws. So it seemed reasonable that the plant eating equivalent to dinosaur, a long-necked dinosaur, that have three, well, let's say, blunt claws. And so they were restored everywhere. That's the Chicago specimen. New York did the same thing as the Smithsonian. Three claws, five fingers, three claws. Dinosaur hands, by the way, are A, symmetrical, and B, really cool. Um, early dinosaurs have five fingers. Is there a to hand up like this? Early dinosaurs are five fingers, but only these three had claws. So, oh, it's these three. You had to do the split, live long, and prosper. And some of you could do that because you wasted so much time. <laughs> <laughs> so much time to let her eat like it. Or you let her eat like it. Do this, and remember that's your basic dinosaur hand. Five fingers, but only these three with claws. And that is found today in. Dinosaur uncles, the living primitive relatives of dinosaurs, crocodiles and alligators. Two rest an alligator, um, and you grab it by the paw, and you'll see three. So it was reasonable to do that. But sometimes being reasonable doesn't help you because of these dinosaurs only have one claw and it's on the thumb. It's huge. But the hands in Gertie don't really help us to identify Gertie as a dinosaur. But Ooh, there we go. You can see there um, on the slide uh, a picture of Kelly's thumb next to the giant thumb claw of dinosaurs <laughs> mouth. And this, when we find tracks of these dinosaurs, that thumb claw, we don't see it. It's carried up off the ground. Probably a fighting spur, um, maybe a plaster to help with age in the act of um, something of that nature. But the other end of the dinosaur, the tail, is interesting too. What is this, Doc? So this is from a beautiful book, hard to find, called So Long Ago, the illustrations are lithographs. Uh, color lithographs. It's a time traveling adventure narrated by the uncle of the young man. Sometimes you can see the two of them in the background. By the tree. By the tree, yes, right there, by the tree. Slowly to a point. Next slide. 
It's based on this lithograph, roughly. This is the second good reconstruction of Brontosaurus itself, as the Pomo Bluff Wyoming, a site called 4810. This is a pretty old individual dinosaur. Pretty big guy, still mounted in the Yale Piedmont Museum of Natural History in New York. It's a beautiful specimen, but the tail is wrong. Next slide. You see that little lithograph in the corner is the first diplodocid cousin of a dinosaur and brontosaurus with tail skeleton in the ground as articulated. And you'll notice that that tail is tapered in a teeny tiny little bone. If we have the next slide, this is the first whip tail that belongs to a pedosaurus proper. This was found in 1914 in Utah. You can't hold that against it. And <laughs> it was found the same year that Bernie was drawn in. So the tail isn't accurate, it doesn't really help us to understand um, the species of dinosaur that is dirty. But if we get the next slide, this is kind of a fun illustration that someone on this panel did. <laughs> uh, illustrating uh, what the last three or four meters of tail would do on the end of a whip tail. Doc, why don't you talk about your drawing? The, um, the tail is extraordinary. I call it a multi-segmental nunchuck. A nunchuck is a weapon that operates with uh, angular momentum. It's too hard wood or aluminum uh, bars with a flexible connector. So you go and you're not crushed when you're hit by a nunchuck. You're not penetrated by the nunchuck. But you do get a nasty high speed wound. It could break a uh, nose, it could break your fingers. Now there are uh, 85 vertebrae in that tail. The last 40 are nunchucks. You don't have a good joint between the successive bones. They're just held together by elastic ligaments. Massive muscles at the base of the tail can swing this multi-segmental nunchuck at speeds. You know, Phil Perry, our, our um, colleague in Edmonton, Alberta, calculated it would break the sound barrier. It would be like cracking a whip and have much more mass than any whip. So this could take the head off immediately back to It's a big owl. Our next slide. All right, in 20 seconds, the um, difference between the Pinosaurus and Brontosaurus, since we're kind of using these names interchangeably, they were named different dinosaurs because of the chunk bones between the hips. And that's why we have Brontosaurus and Pinosaurus. The reason why they were synonymized were because these are growth related characteristics, and that was done in 1903. But the folks at the American Museum, when they mounted that big specimen in 1905, they deferred to the opinion of the person that named the Brontosaurus and the Pinosaurus, not the more recent paper. So they decided to leave their skeleton as Brontosaurus. And really, that's why we're Brontosaurus so with us in pop culture, because the big museum in New York said so. <laughs> Turns out they were right. That's not short for another time. So back to that wonderful skeleton, the AMH 460, rather. And if we get the next slide, we'll see the skull. This is the other end of the that we're talking about. You'll notice that the reconstruction there in the, in the photograph in color, that was part of a jaw from a Pomo Bluff quarry, and mostly a big sculpted skull, which is not terribly accurate. Um, the one on the skull, or the one on the, uh, the big brontosaur mouse in New York is a better representation. And if we hit the next slide, we have a camera source, because the guy that named brontosaurus, brontosaurus, thought it should have a head like this, with big teeth, crushing teeth, big rectangular head, eyes right there, and Turns out, we get the next slide, you'll see where these people's leaning head is slender and pointed, more like a brontosaurus cousin of the locus. The same year that this was put together, we get the next slide, this still was dug up in Utah at what we call Dinosaur National Monument today. And the person that dug it up, well, uh, this was a very careful digger, found it about 12 feet away from the atlas and the axis, the first two were right in the neck. And it turns out the guy that wrote the paper, uh, W.J. Holland, said that this head fits really cleanly, very nicely, onto this giant thick neck. And I think this is the correct skull for a Pythosaurus and Brontosaurus. 
and um, he was trumped by the opinion of New York paleontologists and by the looming shadow of Professor Marsh, who made brontosaurus brontosaurus. Can we have the next slide? You go? Yep, you go next slide. Um, Winter McPhee's reconstruction of Bertie with the, the typical dose of head uh, turns out to be correct. It's the first acne, yes, known reconstruction uh, and a kind of story with a correct head, which is kind of fun. So, Gertie being depicted as an active uh, big dinosaur, like this Louis Ray painting from uh, Dr. Bacher's recent case book, um, is pretty darn accurate. It's a fun representation of these dinosaurs. Not as heavy set swamp bound critters that don't move around a whole lot, but as active, interesting animals. Could you go back one? We use these in Texas to castrate sheep. If I make a sweeping motion like this, protect your. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a the skull from Utah, Dinosaur National Monument, and it's it's tapered. It's in reality it's rather streamlined, but they increase their their uh, speed when flying. They do fly, so they did pay my By the way, we give extra points and extra slices of pie to people who can identify where the eardrum is in dinosaurs. Right there, right behind this little notch. If you have to deal with Timmy, Timmy is the name we professionals have for little kids, usually boys who are around 11, who will correct us on how to pronounce dinosaur names. So in order to humiliate Timmy, humiliating kids, um, especially uh, it, yeah, absolutely. So like, tell me where is the eardrum? And you want to empower adults. Empowering kids, we are. Anyway, this is that nice triangular streamlined head which Diplodocus had and Brontosaurus had. And now we know if you come to the Marston Museum, you'll see that Apatosaurus had, and it's unique to one family of long necks, one family. And the square head put here belongs to a whole different order of dinosaurs. Not a different species or genus or family, a whole different order or side order. Um, with that type of head, who's wrong? Yeah. Uh, Texas, Texas goes. Uh, the, boxing head, the boxing head goes to things like Hammersaurus or the Brachiosaurus, a very, very long neck guy with tall shoulders. So the error was made in New York with the, they decided ahead of time what kind of head it would have. And they ignored the evidence of the head that was found next to the neck of it, which happens all the time in science. <laughs> Who are you going to believe, the stuffy PhD or your own eyes? One fossil is worth any amount of expert opinion. <laughs> Next movie, The Lost World, 1925. So we've moved from uh, rice paper uh, and no cell animation to stop motion animation. This is based on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, book, and um, it was a pretty faithful adaptation of that book. Actually, uh, Doyle appears in this movie in front of this piece uh, in this uh, old silent movie. This is uh, before Hawkins. Uh, there was a, a, a very brilliant animator by the name of Willis O'Brien, uh, and he did stop motion puppets with this, and uh, that's articulated skeletons with uh, rubber or fur, depending on the model, mounted the outside. And uh, his uh, technique helped him because the same gentleman also did a movie we will be around to called King Kong. So uh, he was innovating and learning literally on the fly as he was doing the animation. And it was very lifelike. And if you notice, you have the smoke billowing. So he did a combination of both live action and stop motion to add verisimilitude uh, to his drawings, or to his uh, animation. So, um, well, and notice that you have a herd of long-dead dinosaurs that are in a, a social group there that's kind of fun. 
And there's a mixture of what you see in the absence of savannah today between a wildebeest zebra. In this case, you've got a little blade dinosaur, Stegosaurus, walking into the brain between the contact and the dive of the big long neck and a whoop, and making a beeline out of the range. It's smart to do the same thing. <laughs> Now, if you had gone to the American Museum in New York City, whose skeletons inspired the examinations? You see on the wall paintings, the earlier uh, paintings, of the, the uh, habitat, according to the, the PhDs, which was a swamp that was described as something like the Amazon Basin, gigantic, slow moving, hot, humid rivers, um, oozing out into swampy lowlands during the wet season, and these poor, long necked Brontosaurus, because they were plant eaters, and we all know that plant eaters are wusses and have to hide. According to the, the big heads in New York in the 1920s, when a allosaur was smelled on dry land, all the big herbivores would hide tail it down into the water and submerge themselves. This turns out to be totally 100% upside down. Wrong. My first friend from the National Geographic Center here in Colorado. Actually, look at the sediments, the rock record of the environment. The reason these long necks were said to be living in swamps is if you dig them up here, many of the specimens are in clay. Well, where does a lot of clay develop? Well, back then, the bottom of the pond, the bottom of the swamp. I'm from New Jersey, I know from swamps. Um, growing up, we would get skeletons from swamps. They're usually some uh, uh, Goomba from uh, New York. Did something wrong? <laughs> Often to sea caucus, and sea caucus is a terrible place. There are gases of decomposition churning up the rotting vegetation and the rotting gulags. That's not the whole story. Anyway, it turns out that clay forms, yes, in the bottom of the lakes. It also forms in floods over dry land, and many of the best fossils of land animals are in clays. Um, and First uh, hint from field work that the swamp idea was totally wrong was W.D. Matthew from New York came out here to study our funny pubes, which is about 35 million years old. There are lots and lots of mammals there, same with cats and things that are in between bears and dogs. They're confusingly known as bear dogs. And these yes, skeletons. Well, that's not what you're saying. Um, and W. D. Matthew came back from his field work in 1903 and said, you know, we have it all wrong. These aren't lakes, they aren't swamps, these are floodplains. Uh, mud mixed with volcanic ash would flood over the dry land, cover the skeletons of land animals that died a few weeks before. And we apply the same Matthew and paradigm to, to Chronosaurus, Apatosaurus, the Bodicus. Here in Colorado and elsewhere. And the sediments just scream, just scream. It's from the Bible. In the Bible, there's the verse, the stones will cry out. Anyway, the rocks here, that's true. Um, the rocks, after this, I'll do a little bit of uh, uh, exegesis of the dietary laws. Now, I'll prove to you, duck bill dinosaurs, cooked the right way, are kosher for the high holy days. But that's the side. <laughs> The, the famous long-necked dinosaurs and stegosaurs did move in herds on dry land. They died on dry land. They were buried in the wet season when dry land was covered with a dew of volcanic ash mixed with mud. Mud. I went to college to a college whose motto is in lute veritas. Latin scholars was an in lute veritas. In mud there is truth. <laughs> now, back to that New York connection, uh, on the left side of the screen you see two medium dinosaurs finding the litter, like Jurassic Allosaurus, like the beast I have here to my left, and that is really from a Charles R. Knight painting of really good famous paleo artist who said Laylaps. What's that? Laylaps. It is Laylaps. Where's Laylaps from? What state? Laylaps land? What <laughs> state produced the first good skeleton of a medium dinosaur? Jersey. Jersey! Jersey, okay. Next slide. So, back to the idea that the vegetarian dinosaurs were, were pussies. Um, not so much. You'll, you'll notice here this, uh, this 
uh, Piosaurus taking a bite from an allosaur. And this really did happen. We have a dig site in Morrison, Colorado, we'll half an hour drive from here at Morrison 4810, where around the skeleton of a dinosaur that was about as long as three school buses, there are seven teeth from what? Teeth like these that were lost during feeding around that carcass. So we know that these animals did interact in some way, but don't think of uh, the long neck as a pushover. Next slide. They fight back. Everything fights back. The most dangerous big animals in Africa today are not the predators, but the herbivores, the hippos, and the rhinos, and the elephants. You should be afraid of those. So this is a, a famous scene, and uh, the good doctor loves this scene. Don't mind this. <laughs> I wrote an article for the, the magazine Earth, which is back now, pretty good. And it was called The Bites of the Brontosaurus. They pointed out that the general rule of evolution, and there are rules in evolution, you know, one rule is the most dangerous animal in a land fauna at any one time is the biggest plant eater, the biggest vegetarian. True today in uh, Southeast Asia with the uh, Indian elephant, and very true in Africa with both hippos who kill more people every year than lions, and uh, the black rhino, uh, before it was hunted to near extinction, killed people. And Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus, this is Brontosaurus, are equipped to fight back. Remember the tails they whip with those multiple, multiple segment nunchucks to grab you and slap you across the face or remove your head? Uh, they can also bite, particularly the square-headed long necks like Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus. The teeth are gigantic. They're bigger than an to from the back of the skull right there of these plant eaters, it was filled with gel muscles. Next slide. This reads back to that seat. Eye there. That's the nostril. That's an echo chamber, by the way. So maybe you very loud, probably an uh, infrasonic noise, um, which we call earthquake noise. Most large animals, and some small, can produce a, a a frequency that's so low and powerful makes the earth shake. You don't hear it through the air, you hear it through your toes. Elephants can produce a vibration, an earthquake noise that can be heard uh, 15 miles away. Uh, the earthquake noise you get from that echo chamber probably you go 20 or 25 miles and can be a weapon up close. Uh, a herd of long necked dinosaurs producing earthquake noise at close range could scramble the brain of an allosaur. <laughs> uh, but the teeth here are gigantic, bigger than allosaur teeth. The gel muscles are bigger than allosaur. Camerasaurus could uh, bite back. And the Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus, Brontosaurus, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus could whip you literally. So again, predator prey interactions. This is a fun specimen. This is a big allosaurus specimen from the American Museum of Natural History in New York again. And it's moving over the carcass of a long neck dinosaur and keeping it quiet. And there are bite marks in the carcass today. Look, you can't see them in your seat, but they don't work for there are bite marks in that carcass. Uh, so this early scene in the lost world really does reflect a real predator prey interaction between allosaurus and brontosaurus. What was the jaw pressure like on a long neck like that? Enough to chip wood and branches as thick as your arm. I think of Camarasaur jaws as Jurassic wood chippers. They have more long neck dinosaurs in their habitat, the most powerful jaws. Um, far more uh, bite pressure than anything else related to them. But the guys with the streamlined snout, like Rhinosaurus and Apatosaurus, Strange here, they had very delicate jaws. Yeah. But those are the guys with the whip tails. So, what are we looking at here? What is this? Anybody? What dinosaur is this? Triceratops. You know, Triceratops has a Denver connection. A pair of horn cores were found not far from here in 1887. It was the original basis for our understanding of Triceratops, although they were missing in the place. Okay, a couple of years later, complete skulls, kind of like this, uh, on these models were collected in Wyoming. 
Now, I like this scene personally because it's the depiction of a small group of Triceratops and a young animal there to the flank of the animal on the right. Uh, this is the first depiction of, at least on film, of parental behavior and parental care and dinosaurs in S in Maxine 25. There is a, um, a funny hook to this. A few like Triceratops, it was elected to be the state dinosaur of Wyoming. Um, and people love to imagine Triceratops like um, muskops, that the adults would form a ring and inside would be the young, they'd be protected from the mean, mean, mean T Rex. That's a wonderful idea, and it has no evidence, whatever. Um, many horned dinosaurs were found in herd, the whole herd would die, including youngsters, and be buried at once. Such herds are common for Styracosaurus and Monoclodius and Centrosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus, but never for Triceratops. Triceratops seems to be a loner, small family groups at most. If you get two in one quarry, you're lucky. It's an odd duck. It's not your usual horn dinosaur. It also has the longest horns just about and the strongest frill. That back right there is armor plate and quite fit bone to protect its neck. Well-armored, well-armed, and relatively solitary. What do you guys think? Do you guys think that this 1925 version of the dinosaurs was accurate? Or do you yeah. think it was yeah. fantastical? Accurate. Accurate. Yeah. Fantastical. I don't think it's accurate. It's a creative choice. I think it's a choice, I think. They were choosing from the data they had back then to make a story. Because I, many artists can see a narrative of evolution, how things work together, adults and babies and meat eaters and carnivores and habitats, swamp versus dry land. Artists often are better than us, a stuffy PhD. Could I have a, um, a show of hands? How many people here have a stuffy PhD? <laughs> Very often artists are better than we are. And um, Willis O'Brien was just, he caught it. All right, so in this depiction here on the left, we have a horned dinosaur. It turns out not to exist. It's really a Triceratops, but this is Agathalmus, and uh, Triceratops was named by Edward Frinker Pope. And then to the right is a, the plate of dinosaur stegosaurus, from the state of fossil. And these two animals never could connect one another. There's actually more time that separates those two dinosaurs that separates you and I from the one dinosaur. Almost 20 million years. And artistically, this is very, this trope um, set up uh, by Doyle, uh, where you have, um, you know, just like they say about Jurassic Park, you can call it mostly Cretaceous Park. Uh, it's, it's where you mix time frames and you throw everything and together, and you can even extend it all the way out. We have hominids, sort of Flintstones, uh, this is probably the classic example. But, I mean, for storytelling purposes, truncating time and putting the entire fossil record on a yes. plateau of this way. It's the greatest hits collection. Yeah, it's the greatest hits. I would like to defend Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> he, he did not put a Jurassic dinosaur with a Cretaceous dinosaur. His uh, backstory is this. On this secret plateau in South America, evolution had stalled out three or four times. It stalled out briefly in the Jurassic and things that only extinct in the rest of the world survived. So it's a source. It's a living fossil now, but only on that plateau. And then it stalled out again uh, uh, about 70 million years ago. And you've got triceratops like this. But then it stalled out for a third time about a million years ago with Homo erectus, the uh, Java ape man. And in the novel, there are eight people, and uh, they're very nasty. And the, the white Anglo-Saxon heroes um, do their, um, their duty, a regular Kipling duty, of exterminating the lower form of human life by shooting them and whatnot. So he did make a mistake of putting dinosaurs together in time. He invented this stutter step freeze frame Evolution only in one place, on the Great Plateau.
So you guys want to keep talking uh, more about the moms? We're uh, sure. 15 votes, I suppose. Okay. Thanks for that, James. Lots of cool stuff. King Kong. Okay, again, we're talking about Willis O'Brien. This was his masterpiece. He took, uh, the, this was RKO Pictures. He took, uh, they uh, did the stop motion animation uh, with King Kong and uh, all of the dinosaurs on Skull Island. And uh, they made, uh, the King Kong was uh, one inch equals one foot, so the Kong models were very large. The dinosaurs were all articulated skeletons, uh, machine shop at, at, at uh, RKO Studios. So, uh, and the Kong uh, was made of rabbit fur and rubber, and he would frequently dry out under the hot studio lights, so they had to stop his being particularly expressive. So they, they would have to um, replace bits and pieces of him uh, as they went. So, uh, and uh, this is where O'Brien uh, created a rear projection uh, with matte paintings uh, and split screens. Uh, again, combining the night action and stop motion and created a really high level of uh, screen wizardry, particularly for uh, the early 30s. This scene traumatized me when I was little. He yeah. the tears of John, blood comes out. Yeah, and the sound. Yes. Yeah, it's tragic. There is a hideous anatomical error here, and though I love Willis O'Brien, and I named my first three turtles for us for him. <laughs> Do you notice the sinuous curve of the T-Rex tail? And do want to get the director's cut, which shows how these movable models, plasticity models, were made. You'll see that the T-Rex tail swung very sinuously like a cat tail. Well, even back then, when this movie was being produced in the studio of 1928 29, we had pretty dang good T Rex tails and, and tails from his close skin, Gorgosaurus. And unlike cat tails or Stegosaurus tails or Brontosaurus tails, the tail of T Rex gets stiffer and stiffer and stiffer, less sinuous to go to the rear. So this is an hideous error. Which is still made all the time. If you go see uh, Lost World, uh, you will see entirely too much sinuosity, and that goes for the tail of the dinosaurs too. <laughs> all right, you This is the the original charging, avenging mom vegetosaur. This is the brontosaurus that did come out of the swamps. She was taking a mud bath because of the tick bites. She was in the swamp when the, uh, the sailors and um, uh, actors were in a boat and the head of Mom Brontosaurus comes out of the water and then all of the, all of the sailors in the boat proceed to shoot Mom in the head with 30 odd six cartridges. Now never do that. Now what happens when count of three everybody say roar? One, two, three. <laughs> it only makes her mad. And she pursues the, uh, the sailors up on dry land, dry land, dry land, dry land. Runs faster than they, and one poor fellow, one poor Shoneal, goes up a tree. He's like, you know, he get away from her, but she um, plays with him for a few seconds, and then crunches the, the gentleman quite hard and flips his body off the tree. So it's fun that both in 1925 The Lost World, 1933 in King Kong, the long neck dinosaurs had some animals. They, they weren't unique Jurassic cattle. These were animals capable of defending themselves and going on, on the offense too, especially uh, against naval powers. Um, the sailor that's in tree there. But that skull there, again, is a, a camerasaurus skull, the Jurassic dinosaur, Colorado animal. Uh, Incredibly powerful bite. I would not want to get bitten by a dinosaur. I would really go and get bitten by but definitely not by a dinosaur. So, you want to talk about the drawing? On the other side, on the right side, is a drawing done from an analysis of feeding sites in Wyoming in the Lake Jurassic. And there are broken 
carnivore bones, some of them from baby allosaurs. And if a baby allosaur were chased by an adult mom parasaur, the result would be very much what happened to the man, the minus actor, who shimmed up the tree and was um, then plucked and crunched and tossed away by the avenging mom vegetosaur. Okay, so in this scene we have King Kong and a big flying animal. This is a pterosaur, not a dinosaur. And Fair Ray in the middle. And, oh yeah, there's Fair Ray, of course. <laughs> by more people. Um, anyone know what the flying critter is? Who is that? Pterodactyl. Everybody say it loud, you guys know it. Pterodactyl. It's a tiny pterodactyl. It is random. Right? And you'll notice the size of the head is about the size of Fair Ray. Um, if Fair Ray, I'm going to guess, it was five feet tall. Um, that's about the length of, yeah, of, uh, of a big pterodactylus, or I'm sorry, brand on skull. Um, so that's almost to scale, almost. Now in the uh, animation, there is hideous error number two. There are pterosaurs, pterodactyls, that big. Trying to not know, but in Texas, and I have another museum in Texas, we have the Texas pterodactyl, gets a lot of us. Because the ball will stop. That's what the ball is. And that will get that big. You know, pushing 350 pounds. However, the hind feet are weaker than the arms. Much, much, much weaker. A giant pterodactyl would not grab prey with the hind feet. The toes are too weak. And the claws are straight as if they were used for um, digging nests. They would grab you with the the, the beak. And perhaps with the very sharp, curved claws, on the hand. You remember the little lesson I gave uh, earlier that no dinosaur or dinosaur relative, and pterodactyls are close dinosaur relatives. They have three claws on their hands, and the three claws in these pterodactyls are very, very sharp. It is possible if you do the sums and do the calculation, a 350-pound Texas pterodactyl, that's a qualus, could lift Fay range, about 100 pounds, could lift Fay range. This is my least favorite animal. Yes. This is a plesiosaur, the short neck marine animals. And if anyone looks at the oh, it's monster, I'm not interested down there. Um, this is a marine reptile, not a dinosaur again. Its neck posture, shape of skull, teeth are always kind of a, well, maybe not. But you can tell it's Scotch because of the kill is wearing. I like the spots. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Oh. You want to talk about this one? No, you don't. This is weird. <laughs> this is the weirdest scene in, in King Kong where he's almost modeled to death by something that looks like a 50 foot long snake with four legs. We do have fossils of mid Cretaceous and late Jurassic snake like critters that we little stubby legs, but they're also we little stubby animals, and not uh, not nearly as big. Now, movies do, of course, like to make real animals much bigger than they ever were. Uh, like the Raptors in Jurassic Park, for example. Um, could this animal maybe be like the, uh, the giant snake Titanoboa that uh, lived right after the last dinosaurs became extinct? It didn't have legs. Um, there's another animal called Tanyscrophius that uh, might have been the inspiration for this. Tanistrophius is in the third level. If you're a how many of you are, seriously, are self admitted dino nerds? How many, keep your hands up. How many of you are, keep your hands up. I see a lot of, like, a shame of books out there. You're good for geeks, I'll be embracing. I'm getting high and proud. Come on. Dino geeks. How many of you geeks have heard the word Tanistrophius? Tanistrophius was discovered actually in the 19th century. A close relative is Protorosaurus, and there's a little guy from Virginia. These are very peculiar critters. They are always found in lake or ocean sediment or nearby. They have incredibly long necks, very thin, full of air, like the neck of a pterodactyl. The neck looks like a pterodactyl. The torso is quite compact. 
tails medium long, they have four perfectly good, short but perfectly good legs. They're bizarre. The neck has, the neck vertebra, the pieces of the backbone of the neck have been confused with those of giant Texas pterosaurs. But they're not. They're not related at all. They're distant cousins of crocodiles. What the heck they were doing with this medium, small torso, gigantic long neck to come straight out, straight out of the body. They were very, very weird. My own opinion, they were weird. But they were known at the time the animators wanted something to threaten um, T Rex. He's threatened by uh, threatened the uh, King Kong. He's threatened by T Rex and Vins. He's threatened by this gigantic, weird, snake like tennis trophies, but he wins. He's threatened by a giant uh, fey ray eating uh, pterodactyl, but he wins. There's something heroic about, uh, about King Kong. He's only vanquished by the rear gunner in a two seat Navy biplane. Mm -hmm. uh, the rear gunner is using a 303 machine gun, a modified Lewis gun. The pilot also has 303 U.S. Navy machine guns with interrupter uh, gear. That is, the bullets come out between the propeller blades. That was invented by a Dutchman. Anthony Falker. How many Dutch people here is that name? Dutch people? No Dutch people? No? So you know about Anthony, no, Anthony Falker. Right? The British used to say, um, got into a dog fight with the Falkers. And then get another Fokker would come out behind the British guys and then just surrounded by these little Fokers. <laughs> <laughs> now this is a publicity spill. This was not actually in the movie. But again, we have our state dinosaur here uh, in the Stegosaurus. And uh, you guys want to talk about it? Well, we kind of did at the very beginning. Uh, for those of you that missed that, that part of the talk, <laughs> so this scene, we have a nice great big dinosaur, it's got our stegosaurus, two plates in a row, big face with a, you know that head, that's a snapping turtle head, uh, no cheeks at all, the head of stegosaurus is very small, the biggest one I've seen is about this long, it has wee little cheeks, tiny wee head, very soft quiet, I heard the great paper that was just published about a month ago. I have a biological model, a digital model of stegosaurus type, just about as soft as a Labrador retriever. So on the front end of the animal, it would make a great pet. The back end of the dinosaur is another story. Unlike most dinosaurs, stegosaurus has a prehensile tail. It, it can choose where its tail goes almost to the very tip of the tail, thanks to little bones that articulate between the spools or that are called chevrons and they allow the rosette of four spikes, sometimes eight, depends on the species, to um, ward off and fence against things like Allosaurus that might scare it. So we have an Allosaurus, whoops. Just like that. So out of all of these sequences, which one was your favorite? I'd have to say that my favorite of the animated clips was the mom brontosaurus charging out of the swamp uh, onto dry land, hitting about 35, 40 miles per hour, and catching the, uh, uh, the sailor. Yeah. <laughs> it's brutal and so sick. You gotta check it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's the screaming. Yeah, the scream. It's yeah. worth it for the scream alone. It is. Yeah, well, home scream is nothing on this guy. <laughs> so that's the end. So how much more time do we have back there? Do we have any time?